Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Japan touch points in the Americas, which will cover Japan's economic partnership and international arbitration in Latin America, international arbitration and ADR developments in Japan, and capacity development and international arbitration between the US and Japan. My name is Sandra Friedrich. I'm a lecturer in law here at the University of Miami School of Law. And I'm also the director of Miami Law's International Arbitration Institute and Whiting Case LM program. It's my pleasure to be your moderator today and to welcome you on behalf of the University of Miami School of Law. This webinar series is jointly organized by the University of Miami School of Law, the Miami International Arbitration Society, the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association, and the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center. The first webinar in this series, which focused on international arbitration in the US and the Americas is now available online. Today for the second webinar, we have some very interesting discussions lined up for you. There also will be opportunities to ask questions during the Q&A session, and you can submit all your questions through the Zoom webinar Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And you can do so throughout the webinar. And now without further ado, we will hear opening remarks. I would like to hand over the virtual microphone to Yoshihisa Hayakawa, who is the Secretary General of the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center in Tokyo, which is a co-organizer of this program. Mr. Hayakawa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, audience. Uh, my name is Yoshi Hayakawa. I'm a professor of law at Rikkyo University in Tokyo. But at the same time, I'm serving as an executive director and uh, Secretary General of Japan International Dispute Resolution Center. Uh, we call it the JDRC. And at the first day of the uh, city of the, this webinar, we could learn, uh, we could run uh, excellent education of uh, Miami University assisted by the Miami International Arbitration Society. So today uh, we would like to explain why Japan needs such a excellent education and training program. Uh, and uh, what it is now happening in Japan. And uh, uh, we'd like to explain these issues. And uh, uh, we'd like to emphasize that uh, we need a kind of the cooperation. So thank you very much. And uh, I will pass this microphone to Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayakawa. And now we'll hear a few welcoming remarks from Don Hayden, who's a partner at Mark McDowell & Hayden here in Miami, Florida, and who's also the chairman-elect of the Miami International Arbitration Society, which is another co-organizer of today's program. Don? Thank you, Sandra. As chair-elect of Miami International Arbitration Society, or MIAS as we like to call it, I have the pri privilege of welcoming you to this timely and interesting virtual webinar. The mission statement of MIAS is to foster the growth of international arbitration and encourage Miami and South Florida as a friendly situs for arbitration of international disputes. We're lucky to have Sandra and her team at the University of Miami School of Law and at the International Arbitration Institute as partners in that effort. I hope you enjoy the discussion today and we plan to have many more of these webinars in the days to come. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you both so much for this warm welcome. We will now start with our first discussion session on developing capacity in international arbitration between the US and Japan. First in this session, we will hear from Mr. Yoshihisa Hayakawa, the Secretary General of the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center in Tokyo. And he will provide an overview on the educational and professional training opportunities at the center's hearing facilities. Then Professor Naoki Kanayama will provide a brief overview on the LLM program in global legal practice at KU Law School. Professor Kanayama is a professor of law emeritus at KU University Law School in Tokyo, where he taught courses in contract law, arbitration, and French law. And finally, in this session, I will be giving a short overview on Miami Law's Widen Case International Arbitration LLM program. Mr. Hayakawa, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sandra. I would like to uh, explain something about the, what is happening in Japan and why we need a, such an excellent uh, educational and training program of international arbitration in Japan in this order. 
So the please check the this statistics of the JCAA Japan Commercial Arbitral Association cases. And uh, of course, you know, Japan's uh, economy volume is very big, but compared with the uh, economic volume. So unfortunately, the number of the cases pending in uh, JCAA each year is very limited. So the one of the uh, mystery of the uh, international arbitration, so this phenomena. So the why such a phenomena happen in Japan? So first of all, so the uh, we are not uh, the famous uh, prestigious uh, city uh, as the seat of arbitration. So we do not have a, a any prestigious history as a seat of arbitration like uh, New York City, London, or Paris. And we are also not a neutral place for the case between Japanese cooperation and the foreign one. For example, Geneva, Zurich, uh, Stockholm, and Singapore, these cities are very neutral from the each business corporations. But Tokyo is uh, always a way game for the uh, foreign business corporation, which is uh, have a dispute uh, with the Japanese corporations. So that we found uh, a similar uh, phenomena uh, in German cities. So the, uh, relatively speaking, German cities are not popular as a seat of arbitration in Europe. And one of the reasons is uh, German business corporations are very strong uh, in the business field, and always the German cities are kind of the away place from the viewpoint of the uh, counterparty business corporations. And at the same time, we have a settlement culture in the Japanese society. The, uh, at least the domestic cases, we are always trying to find uh, uh, the solution, amicable solution. And uh, additionally, the, uh, the legal section of the Japanese business corporation have a very weak power and uh, compared with the American corporation, United States corporation. And uh, it means uh, at the uh, time of the, uh, the inserting the arbitration clause, so the, uh, unfortunately, legal section does not have uh, enough time to negotiate and uh, under the pressure of the management. So the many corporations in Japan, except the gigantic trading companies, hesitate to proceed arbitration proceeding in foreign countries. So they tend to uh, easily explore uh, settlements which are favorable to the uh, foreign business corporations. So nowadays, even mid to a small size corporations are involved in international business transactions or investment in foreign countries, but they much more hesitate to proceed arbitration in foreign countries. So that there is a negative effect to the business community in Japan. On the other hand, many Asian countries established special facilities for the hearing of arbitration proceedings in order to make themselves appealing at the seat of arbitration, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Korea, they have a, a excellent hearing places. So the, about until recently in Japan, no facility for hearing uh, arbitration, uh, that is a, a additional negative element. So these are the pictures of the, uh, the facilities uh, in Asian cities. So the Japanese government realized the problem and the Japanese government uh, issued a policy payer, which is uh, called the Law Large Bond Policy 2017, and tried to establish infrastructures needed for encouraging international arbitration in Japan. And the coordination conference for the relevant government sector was established. And additionally, in, even in the private sectors, coordination conference for the relevant entities organized and proposed to establish Japan International Dispute Resolution Center, JDRC, as a driving force entity for the new governmental policy. And the JDRC is a newly established entity for the promotion of international ADR in Japan and to operate new facilities for the hearing of ADR. The aim has been one of the important governmental policies of Japan since 2017 with approximately 8 million US dollar budget. So the, now uh, the, our task is uh, to promote international arbitration and uh, uh, other ADRs to the business corporations in Japan. And uh, doing PR activities of international uh, ADR in Japan to the foreign stakeholders. 
And uh, uh, we are now operating facilities for international uh, arbitration and other type of ADR with advanced technologies in Osaka and Tokyo. So that in Tokyo, we have uh, two hearing rooms, big hearing rooms. One of them is uh, here and uh, six breakout rooms. It means uh, so the two uh, set of the, uh, the hearings could be uh, proceeded in uh, at the simultaneously. So the, uh, you can see the uh, Olympic Games, the logo, and uh, so the, our facilities will be used during the uh, Olympic time uh, this summer uh, by the Court of uh, in Arbitration for Sport. So these are buildings uh, of the, our facilities. So the, these are the pictures of the, uh, our facilities. So the very beautiful and uh, elegant, uh, sit, uh, elegant places for the hearings. And uh, uh, we also you know, the, uh, prepare the equipment for the uh, advanced technology, especially the video conference technologies. And uh, nowadays under the COVID-19 disaster, so that we had to uh, use online meeting system for the hearings that we uh, provided uh, uh, advanced to uh, the video conference systems and so many cameras and uh, which can capture uh, uh, from the various angles uh, to the witness. And we can proceed a very excellent, uh, smooth, uh, high-tech and uh, virtual uh, the witness hearings uh, with the cross-examinations. So the, uh, for the uh, foreign venue, so we could provide uh, the, our breakout room as well. So the one or two uh, witnesses are uh, sitting here and uh, so that they can enter in the uh, arbitration proceedings from Japan and uh, other arbitrators and councils are located in the foreign country, but there's uh, no obstacle. And our video conference technology uh, is, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, have uh, uh, the very excellent uh, simultaneous translation systems. So that this uh, trans simultaneous translation booth is uh, directly connected to the uh, Zoom uh, meeting systems. So Zoom uh, meeting system have uh, uh, the several uh, language channels. So the, uh, and the these booths is uh, directly connected to the Zoom direct uh, language channels. So the, it means a simultaneous translator can easily operate uh, their own uh, the, uh, the systems uh, using the, uh, the very accustomed to uh, the simultaneous booth systems as well. And we are providing uh, automatic transcriptive service by artificial intelligence. It is a little bit premature, but sooner or later it will be, uh, become very perfect and uh, we could make a transcription. Uh, without any human being assistance. And uh, we are uh, going to provide a file management platform for arbitration cases so that we could virtually manage uh, the uh, arbitration cases by this kind of the systems. And uh, uh, each uh, party or any party or any arbitration institution can use uh, these systems if they would like to uh, proceed the hearing in our uh, the, uh, center. And finally, the, uh, the most important issue, important task uh, for our uh, institute or center is uh, education and training for the human resources on international area in Japan. So the, uh, in these uh, two, one or half years, so we uh, provided uh, education program or training program with the ICC or with the Pepperdine University for the mediation or a uh, court of arbitration for sport, or uh, IP institution for the IP arbitration. And uh, we provided uh, uh, many e-learning programs for the uh, young generation, even under the uh, COVID-19 disasters. So the, and, uh, uh, we are going to providing the international arbitration classes uh, to each university. So these are the, our present activities for the education and the training. So Japan is now trying to increase the number of the cases which use Japan's seat of arbitration or at least a venue for the hearing. For this purpose, new facilities for hearing of arbitration is and will be provided with a reasonable price. So many seminars, symposium, symposium and events is and will be held in Japan and other countries. 
But the most important task of JDLC is to provide various training and educational courses of arbitration and mediation to Japanese young lawyers or young generations. So we need the assistance of perhaps Miami University and the legal community of Florida. So that is the reason why we try to uh, make this webinar uh, two series of the sessions. So thank you very much, Sandra, I'll pass. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayakawa. I now would like to invite Professor Kanayama to provide an overview on the LM program in global legal practice at Cato Law School. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you again for providing me with this very precious opportunity to speak about what is going on at Keio University Law School. I personally involved in the creation of this LLM program more than five years ago, that, that started more than five years ago. And I was one of the member of the committee to conceive the contents and the program of the, the LLM program. And finally, we have decided to create LLM program in global legal practice. To put it shortly, a GLP. And that started in April, 2017. And it was the first and still the only serious LLM course offered in English within Japanese law schools. Some law school has a kind of LLM program, but nothing can be compared with others. We can be proud of that. In fact, we offer more than 70, of 70 courses. Nothing is compulsory, but the students can choose among the variety of courses offered by the KO University. And the students are from America, Asia, and Europe, and from Africa also. And the reason we have emphasized the courses on ADL is, I think, the starting point is that ju Japanese judicial system works too well, too good, so that we are not well trained in the ADL, especially in, in the field of arbitration. So young lawyers normally don't have an experience to have been involved in arbitration. Neither there are very few arbitrate, Japanese arbitrators who work in the global uh, dimension, dimension. And <clears throat> the characteristics of Japanese uh, uh, KO LLM program is to provide these kind of business oriented courses and especially what can be charming for international students is the Japanese language courses. It's optional courses, but traditionally, KO foreign language education, including Japanese, is very well appreciated among the uh, citizens and among the international students. So by coming to KO University, non-Japanese students can improve their Japanese if they want. But of course, since all courses are taught in English, they don't need to learn any Japanese. Nowadays, they can live uh, uh, without saying any word of Japanese. Uh, there's no problem. And KO can offer a kind of various internships for the international students. And uh, about, well, let me see. About the uh, uh, tuitions, tuitions, the uh, next page, sorry for that. Uh, tuitions, it's about 1.7, uh, 6 or 7 million yen. If I put it in US dollar, it makes about 30,000 US dollars. So compared to the uh, US LLM, it's 
almost less than one fourth or one fifth. And in addition to that, uh, there is a scholarship, very special one you can find about the page on scholarship information. Every year, one LLM international student is eligible for the very special Keio University Scholarship, which is entitled Design the Future Award for International Students. Since there are less than 40 students, the candidates has a chance, good chance to get that scholarship. And, but I'm sorry, I don't know the detail of the uh, scholarship, but it should be very, very good. It can even, it can even cover the uh, uh, living costs, but I cannot guarantee for the moment because I'm already retired from KO. Then I have to talk about the contents, the program of KO LLM and what, uh, what we can, be proud is its relationship with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CRAP of the UK. And we offer three different courses, Introduction to Arbitration and International Commercial Arbitration, one in a mediation. And by taking each of them, one of them, you can get, you can become either associate member or member or accredited mediator of, uh, uh, of that uh, chartered institute. And uh, <clears throat> if you are not uh, interested in getting the uh, degree, LLM degree, and if you want to save money, you can, just take these three courses, it's okay. And the tuition is mm, much uh, less than the full uh, time students fees. A further, we offer a uh, very uh, variety of the international dispute relation, uh, resolution related courses, as you can see here. And uh, wow, there are many courses, but uh, uh, maybe less than that you have at Mayavi University. And uh, I hope, uh, well, coming to Japan and living Japan after the COVID-19, of course, will be a very, very exciting moment for the students. I can guarantee that it's a very safe city. And uh, if you, are in, if you are interested in coming to Japan, KO can be the best place for the future global lawyers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Kanayama. And I will now give a very brief overview on our LLM and international arbitration here at the University of Miami School of Law before we move on to session two. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, perfect. So the LLM program at the University of Miami School of Law is a highly selective boutique program um, that brings together about 50 students every year um, from about 35 countries around the globe. So it is a very, um, very diverse program. The program welcomes both US and foreign trained law graduates who wish to specialize in the field of international arbitration. But we also welcome more experienced um, lawyers, both US and foreign trained, who are looking to redirect their careers or deepen their knowledge in the field of international arbitration. So it's also a very diverse group, not just geographically, but also in terms of professional experience as well. And over the course of nine months, which is the length of the program, it's a two semester program, the students will engage in intense study of both theoretical and practical aspects of international commercial and investment arbitration. We have over 20 international arbitration courses that are offered during the LLM, both introductory and advanced level courses, 
and like I said, both on investment and commercial arbitration. We also have a number of specialty courses that we offer together with our other LM programs in certain areas and sectors such as maritime, so we have a course on maritime arbitration, sports arbitration, and also the arbitration of art disputes. And those are offered jointly with our other specialty LLM programs. In our Writing Case International Arbitration LLM, our students learn from some of the leading practitioners and academics in this field. Um, our faculty comprises, for example, Karen Lamb, who is a partner at Writing Case in Washington, DC. She's also a Miami Law alumna, and she serves as the distinguished faculty chair of our LLM program. Also, we have Meg Kinnear, the Secretary General of ICSID, teaching in the program, Albert Jan Vandenberg, um, of course, the founding partner of Hannes Jo Vandenberg and a very renowned international arbitrator, as well as, um, for example, Dan Gonzalez, who is the global head for international arbitration at Hogan Lovells and uh, right here in Miami. And of course, last but not least, Jonathan Hamilton, a partner at Whiting Case as well, who serves as the faculty chair of our International Arbitration Institute. And in addition to these theoretical courses, our students also focus very much on the practical lawyering skills, the hands-on skills like advocacy in international arbitration, drafting of arbitration provisions, legal research, and so forth. And last but not least, the students also have the opportunity to work alongside practitioners outside of the classroom through semester-long placements in our international arbitration practicum program with law firms um, both here in Miami and also um, elsewhere. Now, when attending our LM program, uh, our students also get to take advantage of being at the University of Miami School of Law more broadly. And of course, Miami Law is one of the premier US law schools, is one of the largest private research universities in the country. And we have a very long standing tradition of engagement with the law of arbitration that actually goes back all the way to the 1950s. Back then the focus was on domestic arbitration and now of course we very much focus on international arbitration as well. So at the law school, the students are also able to take um, any of the courses offered on core US law um, as well as international law, foreign law, comparative law and so forth. There's over 300 lectures, seminars, workshops and clinics every year. And practically all of them are open to our LLM students as well. So students can take other courses like American contracts law or civil procedure, constitutional law. Students can also take courses on other forms of dispute resolution, litigation skills, um, alternative dispute resolution, mediation, negotiation, and so forth. So it's a very, it's a very um, diverse course offering there as well. And then outside of the classroom, our students um, are assigned a dedicated and experienced career advisor who will meet with them from the beginning of the program really um, up until they graduate and after um, to discuss their job opportunity, their perspectives, um, help them draft a resume and so forth. Miami Law also participates in a number of highly prestigious job fairs. Um, I'm just going to mention the New York job fair here for international lawyers, which is a very important job fair and only about 30 law schools um, do, put, do get to participate in that one. Um, networking is also a very important component of our program. Um, we um, make uh, many of the international arbitration lectures and conferences available to the students, both those organized by the law school, but of course also those organized by the various other organizations uh, right here in Miami, which of course is one of the leading arbitration centers in the US. Our graduates can also qualify to sit for the bar exam in the United States with the LLM only as in certain states, including New York and California, that is a, a very attractive option for many students and international students obtain a work permit for one year after graduation so they can stay in the country and put those skills um, to the test that they learned in the program. And of course, uh, the students get to live and work in Miami, which is a very vibrant um, city, multicultural city right here at the crossroads of the Americas. And I'm mindful of my time. Um, so I'm just going to put up the slide here briefly with the study options. 
Uh, we are full-time and part-time. We start twice a year in August and January. We also have a two-year JD LLM joint degree program where you can graduate with both degrees in as little as two years, no LSAT required. And we also have a number of intensive legal English offerings for those students who would like to first focus on their legal English skills, writing, speaking, researching, and drafting before starting the LLM experience. Um, and last but not least, I put here some notes on the application process. I should mention that there's a number of scholarships available as well. We will make all the materials available afterwards. So I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And with that, we are going to start our second session now of this webinar, which will focus on Japan's economic partnership and international arbitration in Latin America. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our two distinguished panelists for the second part of the webinar. Our first panelist is Jake Bukhari, who's a partner at the law firm of Penza Arrieta here in Miami, Florida, where he leads the firm's litigation and dispute resolution practice. Mr. Bukhari has experience representing clients in domestic U.S. and multi-jurisdictional litigation, arbitration, appearing in proceedings administered by a variety of arbitral institutions, including the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association, as well as in investigations and crisis situations in a variety of industries, including aero, auto, banking, finance, energy, hospitality, and private equity. Mr. Bukhari has represented clients in contentious and regulatory matters across the U.S. and in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. He's a graduate of the University of Miami School of Law, and prior to returning to Miami to join Tenza Arrieta, he worked in Asia for more than a decade, practicing at Whiting Case in Tokyo, where he also was a registered foreign attorney with the Japan Federation um, of Bar Associations, and then serving as the senior group counsel for Standard Chartered Bank in Singapore. And we will also hear in this session from Takashi Yokoyama, who is a 2018 graduate of our International Arbitration JD LLM Joint Degree Program, and who works as associate with Tenza Arrieta in Miami. Before we start, I also would like to remind our audience that you can submit questions through the Q&A function of the webinar that we will answer in the Q&A session later. And with that, Jake Takashi, please go ahead. Thank you, Sandra. Um, this is session two on Japan's economic partnership and international arbitration in the Americas. We'll first address some economic data points relevant to Florida, then we'll canvas some arbitration data, and finally we'll discuss investment arbitration involving Japanese parties. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the uh, Enterprise Florida. We can show the data of FDI and employment in the US. Now we are uh, explaining about the uh, uh, impact, economic impact on uh, US, Japanese economic impact on US. In 2019, the latest year of available data in terms of investment dollars in the US, Japan ranks the first. In 2018, the latest year for which data is available in terms of jobs created in the US, Japan ranked second behind the UK. This is a significant improvement in Japan in the United States. The next slide, again courtesy of Enterprise Florida, shows Florida specific data. Um, there is no specific statistical data available on foreign direct investment itself in the state of Florida. However, there is data in terms of FDI created employment. And in that regard, Asia PAC region accounted for 10% of the jobs created in Florida and Japan ranked sixth for FDI jobs created by country in Florida. Of the Asia PAC region created FDI employment, Japan accounts for over 60% of the jobs created. Here, uh, this slide shows Florida merchandise imports. We can share that uh, Japan ranks as the second exporting country to Florida behind China. 
Not surprisingly, the top merchandise important category is uh, by far from Japan to Florida, it's motor cars and vehicles. It's interesting fact. So over 500 Japanese companies have locations in Florida. Japan ranks third behind only the United Kingdom and Canada. Multinationals with Latin American headquarters in Florida include companies such as Olympus, Sony, Ricoh, and Yamaha. Now we can show the factors that attract Japanese companies. Why Japanese companies are located in Florida? The reason shows that Florida's economy ranks the fourth largest in the US and the 17th largest in the world. In addition, due to the strategic geographic locations, Florida serves as a gateway to Latin American markets. Also, Florida is ranked among the most business friendly states in the United States. And Florida has a multimodal transportation system, includes 20 commercial airports and 15 seaports. Finally, Florida's workforce total is approximately 10 to 25 million, many of whom have cultural and linguistic diversity. Japan signed 22 treaties with investment provisions and 36 bilateral investment treaties. Among them, there are four TIPs and three bits between Japan and Latin American countries. There is no TIP or bit between the United States and Japan. Now we turn to international arbitration with Japanese companies in the Americas. We can show the slide. Next slide. Here uh, we found uh, 26 reported cases involving Japanese parties in the past 10 years. Then there are the majority were had by courts in California and New York because both states are popular international business venues, and also New York has a favorable choice, choice, choice of law rules. That's the reason uh, Japanese companies tend to choose the, this venue. Turning to investment arbitrations, there are 10 known cases brought by Japanese parties, and two of these involve the Americas. They are Bridgestone versus Panama and SMM, which is owned by Sumitomi Metal Mining, versus Peru. We'll run through these quickly. Okay, this is the Bridgestone case, and this slide diagrams the parties and the claims. Um, the claimants were Bridgestone Licensing Service Inc. and Bridgestone Americas Inc., which we'll call BSLS and BSAM, respectively, following the de designations used by the tribunal. They're U.S. subsidiaries of Bridgestone Japan and part of the Bridgestone Group of Companies. The major business of the group is the manufacture and sale of tires under the trademarks Firestone and Bridgestone. These marks were registered in Panama. Luque Group of Companies marketed in Panama Chinese manufactured tires bearing the mark Riverstone. Murias, a member of the Luque Group, applied to register Riverstone in Panama. Bridgestone Japan and BSLS, as owners of the Firestone and Bridgestone marks in Panama, issued proceedings opposing registration of Riverstone on the grounds of consumer confusion. The opposition proceedings were unsuccessful. Thereafter, Murias filed actions before the courts in Panama against BSJ and BSLS, alleging a civil tort claim seeking five US million dollars for damages, suffered as a consequence of having to cease selling Riverstone tires as a result of the trademark opposition proceeding. The claim was dismissed at the first instance and on appeal. The decision in favor of the Bridgestone entities was then reversed by the Supreme Court of Panama, which awarded $5 million in damages against them. Then claimants brought claims both based on investments consisting of Firestone trademark and licenses to use Firestone and Bridgestone under the U.S. Panama Trade Promotion Agreement. The tribunal converted several issues. The first issue was whether ownership of license 
may constitute an investment under the treaty and exit convention. The second issue was the applicable law, whether the Panama Supreme, uh, the Panama Supreme Court wrongly granted and appealed and, or admitted evidence. The third issue was whether there had been a denial of justice as determined by applying the principles and standards of customary international law. The tri tribunal ruled uh, ownership of a license to use the Firestone trademark constitutes an investment in Panama for the purpose of the PTA and the ICSID Convention. With regard to standing of the British stone entities, the tribunal concluded that under the TPA, just as the parent company holding the requisite nationality can bring a claim for an alleged denial of justice experienced by its subsidiary, can a licensee hold the requisite nationality bring a claim in respect of the alleged denial of justice? Covered investment, the tribunal framed the heart of the dispute as whether BSJ and BSLS suffered a denial of justice at the hand of the Supreme Court of Panama. That's the question. In applying the rules of the circumstances, uh, this is uh, interesting. The tribunal turned to the expand report of the Professor Jan Paulson, which addressed the widely employed factors used to determine whether denial of justice occurred. Here are the five criteria, uh, five criteria of the denial of justice he addressed. It's important to note that prior to the tort action in Panama, Munayas had entered into a representation and distribution agreement with LV International to commercialize Riverstone in the U.S. and in other countries. So in the U.S., LV filed an application with the USPTO to register Riverstone. Members of the Bridgestone Group, which did not include BSLS or BSAM, opposed registration. Uh, in that connection, the Washington office of Foley and Lardner, on behalf of Bridgestone and Firestone, wrote to counsel for LV demanding that it cease from using Riverstone in the U.S. and in other countries. This letter, defined as the Foley letter by the tribunal, played an important part in the Panama tort action. Would IS use the Foley letter to support its claim that it had been afraid of marketing tires bearing the Riverstone mark? In ruling in favor of the Bridgestone entities and dismissing Modias' claims, the, the court of forced instance made no ruling on admissibility of the Foley letter. Modias appealed and the Foley letter appeared prominently with regard to liability at the second instant court. The Bridgestone entities argued that Modias improperly introduced the Foley letter and it should have been rejected. Ultimately, the appeals court confirmed the decision of first instance. Uh, cassation proceedings followed. Um, and one of the reasons the appellate advanced in support of its application for cassation was that the appellate court completely ignored relevant evidence, including the Foley letter. In finding grounds uh, for cassation, the Supreme Court found that the Court of Appeal had in fact ignored the Foley letter, and it found that that letter was obviously intimidating and reckless conduct on the part of the Bridgestone entities. Turning to the arbitration and arguing that Panama had denied claimant's justice, uh, they, the claimants asserted that the Supreme Court judgment was, quote, shocking, arbitrary, and profoundly unjust. The claimants alleged that they had been denied due process because the judgment was based on legal provisions different from that relied upon by Modias in its claim, and that the Supreme Court judgment was wrongly based on the Foley letter. The tribunal acknowledged, uh, the tribunal examined the grounds upon which cassation had been obtained. They noted that the claimants proffered no support uh, for the no supporting decisions that the Supreme Court had wrongly granted cassation. cassation sorry. Turning to the Foley letter, the tribunal, con the tribunal concluded that the issue of its status was both artificial and irrelevant, and that the letter was a straightforward document. Although the tribunal identified defects in the reasoning of the Supreme Court, it found none to be more than errors of judgment falling far short of demonstrating that the judgment was the product of incompetence or corruption and therefore the tribunal dismissed the claims of the Bridgestone entities. The case is noteworthy not least because of the 10 investment arbitration involving Japanese parties. This is the first where the Japanese party suffered a complete loss. 
Next, we want to bring to your attention the latest investment arbitration cases involving Japanese parties. This case uh, is the SMM Central Belt Netherlands BB Republic of Peru was filed in May 2020. The tribunal just was only constituted in March 2021, although still early doors, this should be an interesting case to follow. And finally, uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to share an appendix of international arbitration cases involving Japanese companies, Japanese parties in US from 20, uh, 2010 to the 2021. Thanks to our uh, University of Miami students, uh, Emma and Christine at the University of School uh, compiled uh, this uh, research. I, uh, we can share the 26 cases identified Japanese parties, including household names like Toyota, Marubeni, Sojits, Hitachi, Toshiba, and Mitsubishi. You can find our famous Japanese uh, international arbitration cases publicly available uh, in the court proceeding. We will share after the webinar this, uh, this data. Thank you so much, opportunity. Uh, we will hand things back to Sandra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake and Takashi. That was very interesting. We will now move to our last panel of the day, which will focus on international arbitration and ADR development in Japan. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our two distinguished speakers for this panel. We have with us today, Professor James Claxton, who is a professor at Rikyo University in Tokyo, Japan. Professor Claxton also has taught at Waseda University in Japan and in our Writing Case International Arbitration LLM program here at Miami Law. Aside from teaching, Professor Claxton also serves as an independent arbitrator and mediator specializing in commercial and investment disputes. He has experience in cases brought under civil laws, common laws and investment treaties arising particularly in the commercial, communications, construction, energy, investment, intellectual property, and transportation sectors. Also speaking on this panel will be Shinji Ogawa, who is the case manager at the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association in Tokyo, where he has worked in various capacity for more than 10 years. Before we start, I would like to remind our audience again to submit questions through the Q&A function um, of the webinar, because we will have time to answer your questions after the session in the Q&A. And with that, James Shinji, please go ahead. Thanks, Sandra. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And depending on where you are, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today from Japan to talk about the myth and the reality about Japan seated international arbitration. Sorry. Back to 1991, 30 years ago, Charles Reagan, one of the most experienced US attorneys, wrote an article that was quite critical of arbitration in Japan and specifically the JCA arbitration. His experience came from a JCA administered arbitration case involving the disputes between a company in the Caribbean island and one of the most major company in Japan. The dispute was over an alleged breach of an exclusive distributorship agreement. He faced severe difficulties during the process of JCA arbitration at that time. Among other things, he was not allowed to represent his client in Japan due to the Japanese Lawyers Act. The arbitrators must reside in Japan and must be on the JCA's own list. The language arbitration was not specified in the arbitration agreement and consequently, 
he had to have the opponent's brief in Japanese translated into English. All oral proceedings were conducted in Japanese. The exchange of readings took two years with more than two dozen submissions. Hearings were conducted on and off over two years with nearly 20 meetings in the meanwhile, etc., etc. Today, these are no longer the case. Representation. Five years later, in 1996, the Foreign Lawyers Act was revised. Under this act, foreign lawyers may represent in international arbitration cases, even if they are not registered in Japan. Still, there was restrictions on the scope of international arbitration cases. For example, the disputes between the Japanese subsidiaries of foreign companies were regarded as non-international cases. To take a leap further, in 2020, last year, the Foreign Lawyers Act was revised to expand the scope of international arbitration cases. As one of the recent initiatives taken by the government of Japan to promote Japan as seat of arbitration. And now, foreign lawyers may also represent the parties where the governing law is not Japanese law, where the arbitration between the companies, if one of the companies is more than 50% owned by a foreign company, or where the seat of arbitration is outside Japan. Japan's touch point is Americas. And first of all, in the last 10 years, 170 cases in total have been filed with the JCAA, and 86% of which are international cases. In the same period, nearly 15% of international cases involve the parties located in the Americas. Mm -hmm. The total number of parties from the America in the same period was 35 in total. The United States is continually in the top five nationalities of non-Japanese parties to the JCAA international arbitration cases. In the same period, half of the law firms representing parties from the Americas were US-based law firms. I would say today, the foreign parties' right to appoint its local counsel in international arbitration cases is fully respected. Selection arbitrators. JCAA maintains and published its panel of arbitrators. The number of panel arbitrators is over 400, two thirds of are non-Japanese. Our panel has over 50 nationalities. I would like to stress here that the parties may appoint arbitrators who are not listed on the JCA's panel. Again, the JCA has touch point in the Americas. Arbitrators from the Americas consists of about 20% of Japanese panel of arbitrators, especially the United States is the second most common nationality in the JCA panel of non-Japanese arbitrators following the United Kingdom. The number of each nationality of the America is here. And most of the America's arbitrators reside outside Japan. JCAA is making further efforts to diversify its arbitrator candidates. Among the arbitrators appointed in the JCAA international arbitration cases, more than half are non-Japanese. 
Furthermore, you might be interested in how the JCAA would take nationalities into account when it is empowered to appoint an arbitrator. Under the JCAA rules, if any party requests the JCAA to appoint an arbitrator of a third and neutral nationality, JCAA shall respect such requests. In the last decades, there were several cases where the foreign parties made such requests. None of these cases did JCAA appoint the Japanese arbitrator. The neutrality is highly guaranteed. Aside from the nationalities, JCA is very flexible with the appointment of arbitrators. JCA does always welcome any input or opinions from the party to the JCA arbitration regarding the requirements that they think the arbitrator candidate should meet. Languages. Under the JCA rules that are in line with the global standards, the parties can agree on the language of arbitration. And in the absence of such agreement, the arbitral tribunal will decide the language. In the recent five years in JCA arbitration, only 25% of arbitration agreements specified the language of arbitration. And in most cases, the parties agreed on the language after the arbitration was commenced. What happened if the parties cannot still reach an agreement on the language of arbitration? In all recent cases, the arbitral tribunal decided the language of arbitration be the same as the language of the contract, which was either in English or Chinese. Consequently, in more than half of the international cases, the language of arbitration was English. Arbitration procedure. The current arbitration procedure at the JCAA are in line with the global standards. And first, the general flow is request for arbitration, answer, statement of claim, statement of defense, reply, rejoinder, and consecutive hearings. How about the duration of the proceedings? In average, it takes 12.6 months from the date of the constitution of the tribunal to the date of the final award. Stepping further to make the actual proceedings more streamlined and efficient, in 2019, JCAA devised its arbitration rules and launched new rules. Commercial arbitration rules have been repeatedly devised to date and have articles that conform to international standards. Among other things, expedited arbitration proceedings, emergency arbitrator proceedings, accommodating multi-party and multi-contract disputes, and the tribunal authority to conduct hearings remotely, and so on. Have you ever thought during the arbitrary proceedings how this arbitral tribunal is forming its preliminary views about your case? More directly, what is the tribunal thinking now? If you knew the tribunal's preliminary views, you might think you could argue and prove your case more efficiently and persuasively. Our new rules may provide a solution for you. As the name suggests, interactive arbitration rules encourage the interaction between the arbitral tribunal and the parties during the arbitral proceeding. The best part is that the tribunal is required to present to both parties its preliminary views with regard to the important issue to be finally decided by the tribunal. 
This interaction is intended to enhance the predictability and efficiency of the arbitral proceedings. And JCA also handles the arbitration under the ancestral arbitration rules. Not only the JCAA making efforts to make the arbitration proceedings more efficient and cost effective, but also the Japanese government is taking initiatives to promote Japan as seat of arbitration. The current arbitration law of Japan, which came into effect in 2004, models on the 1985 version of the Anstar model law on international commercial arbitration. The interim draft of the amendment to arbitration law was released by the Ministry of Justice in March, and this prescribes the rules on the recognition and enforcement of the interim measures issued by the arbitral tribunal in accordance with the 2006 version of the actual model law. Furthermore, the draft takes one step further to make Japan more user-friendly to foreign users. If the Japanese court finds it, it is appropriate, find it appropriate, it can dispense with the requirement to submit the Japanese translation of all or part of the arbitral award or evidentiary documents in the enforcement stage or others. Closing, if Charles Reagan had experienced the current JCA arbitration or the arbitration seated in Japan, how would he feel about it? I hope his answer would be not quite good, but much improving. Thanks for listening and over to James. Thank you very much, uh, Shinji-san. And thank you to the JIDRC, the JCAA, and the University of Miami, as well as the Miami In International Arbitration Society for having me. Uh, Shinji-san has talked about international arbitration related to Japan. I will discuss mediation. The profile of international commercial mediation has been rising. The first treaty on mediation was adopted by the United Nations in 2018. That treaty, the Singapore Convention, makes it easier to enforce settlement agreements resulting from cross-border mediation. In parallel, the United Nations revised its model law on international commercial mediation. This instrument serves as a prototype for states seeking to implement laws on mediation or modernize the ones they have. The Singapore Convention and model law reflect a growing appetite for cross-border mediation. The Global Pound Conference Series, which came to Miami in 2017, collected data from thousands of participants from 31 countries about their attitudes towards mediation. The results suggest that businesses and lawyers value mediation and want to use it more. International mediation institutions have been popping up around the world, including here in Japan. Meanwhile, international mediation has made inroads in particular industries. Mediation of construction disputes is growing in many parts of the world, and mediation is being prioritized for investment disputes. Some new generation investment treaties even make mediation a precondition to arbitration. Meanwhile, states including Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and China are prioritizing mediation as a means to resolve disputes related to the Belt and Road Initiative. What about mediation in Japan? How often is mediation used to resolve business disputes and what form does it take? The Japanese culture is known to place a high value on social harmony. Mediation would seem to be a natural fit. With the remainder of my time, I would like to provide a survey of the use of commercial mediation in Japan. I will begin by considering why Japanese businesses tend to avoid litigation and how mediation has developed in the country. I will then review initiatives to encourage the mediation of cross-border 
business disputes. Finally, I will consider why this topic should be of interest to businesses in the Americas. The first article of the first written constitution of Japan decreed that social harmony is the guiding principle of Japanese society and that disputes should be avoided. Anyone who has been to Japan will have seen that this value is internalized. In crammed trains in Tokyo, passengers are quiet and respectful of each other. School children wear matching uniforms and often matching yellow hats. Businesses tend to operate by consensus. Some argue that this cultural emphasis on harmony and conflict avoidance has also contributed to low per capita rates of civil litigation, subject mentioned by Professor Hayakawa. Other factors may be as relevant. The outcomes of court cases in Japan tend to be predictable, and there are comparatively few lawyers and judges. There are also systems in place that divert cases from litigation, including court annexed mediation. This preference for conflict avoidance extends to the use of international arbitration. In 2018, for example, the ICC administered 210 cases with parties from the United States, but only 31 cases with Japanese parties. In the same year, the leading arbitration institution in Asia by cases registered, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, administered 109 arbitrations with US parties and only 30 with Japanese parties. This is a particularly relevant marker because many Japanese companies operating overseas put SEAC arbitration clauses in their contracts. Times may be changing. The JIDRC and the JCAA have improved the international arbitration infrastructure in Japan, as you've heard today. Japanese laws on the practice of international arbitration were modernized last year, and the Jap Japan Arbitration Act of 2003 is in the process of being revised. Yet it remains that Japanese companies are less likely to litigate in court or in arbitration than their counterparts in the Americas. What does that mean for mediation? The history of formalized mediation in Japan might begin with the adoption of the civil conciliation law in 1951. This law provides for mediation supported by courts that is mandatory for some types of disputes and elective for others. In 2018, more than 34,000 disputes were mediated under this system with a settlement rate of about 57%. In 2019, a parallel regime was put in place for intellectual property disputes. One advantage of these court annexed mediation systems is that any settlement agreements that result from mediation can be enforced like court judgments in Japan. Japan has more recently enacted legislation to encourage mediation outside of the court system. In 2007, a law on the promotion of ADR came into force that regulates mediation providers and improves conditions for private mediation. For instance, courts can suspend litigation proceedings while the claims are mediated under this law. Despite the initiative, extrajudicial mediation has not been widely used in Japan. One exception is the use of mediation to resolve disputes related to the 2011 Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. More than 5,000 disputes were referred to mediation under this scheme in its most active year. This suggests that private mediation can be effective in the right conditions. Mediation proceedings in Japan would probably be unfamiliar to many in the Americas. Court annexed mediation, by far the most common type, is conducted by panels of three mediators chosen by courts that comprise a judge and two co-conciliators who tend to be lawyers or business people. Disputing parties have short meetings with panels once or twice monthly. The whole mediation process tends to take at least two months. Although the mediation panels have no authority to impose settlement agreements on the parties, they tend to tell them how they should resolve their disputes and the parties tend to follow their advice. 
those of you with experience with international commercial mediation are probably used to a different process. Commercial mediations are often held over one or two consecutive days. There is commonly one mediator who is selected by the parties. The mediator may help the parties to evaluate the risks of their positions, but many commercial mediators will stop short of telling the parties how their disputes should be resolved. In the past, this model of mediation was unfamiliar to most businesses in Japan, but that is changing. In 2017, an idea began to take shape among a small group of business lawyers in Tokyo and Osaka who had acted for clients in successful cross-border mediations. They reasoned that mediation should and would be used more often by Japanese businesses if the businesses and their attorneys were more familiar with international mediation practice and if mediation resources were available. This idea led to the creation of the Japan International Mediation Center. The JIMC began operations in 2018 with a secretariat office and mediation rooms in Kyoto. However, the center has gone on to administer mediations outside of Kyoto, in Osaka, and also online. Recently, the JIMC has been working with the Singapore International Mediation Center to manage mediations related to the COVID pandemic. The JCAA has also improved the conditions for private mediation in Japan by modernizing its rules. The 2019 commercial mediation rules notably reinforce the confidentiality of mediations and make the process more responsive to users. For instance, the rules obligate a mediator and parties to have an early discussion about whether the mediator will make proposals for settlement. This diverges from port annexed mediation where such proposals are a matter of course. Japanese laws have also been revised to facilitate cross-border mediation. Last year, a law on legal services in Japan was amended to permit foreign lawyers to represent parties in Japan-related mediations. This is possible where there is a foreign element to a dispute or where Japanese law is not the substantive law governing this, the dispute. Why should these movements in Japan matter to businesses in the Americas? American businesses that include mediation in dispute planning and management are likely to find that their Japanese business partners and their lawyers are more knowledgeable about international mediation than ever before. The Singapore Convention, JIMC, JCAA rules revisions have the attention of many in Japan. Meanwhile, institutions, including the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, the Singapore International Mediation Institution, and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators have been training Japanese lawyers and businesses in mediation and accrediting mediators in Japan for the first time. Many of these events and trainings have been in Japanese or in English with simultaneous interpretation into Japanese, which has broadened the audiences. The potential of mediation to resolve disputes between American and Japanese businesses may also benefit from the events of the past year. The pandemic has resulted in more business disputes and has sown the seeds for disputes in the future. Courts in the United States, for example, have seen a rise in commercial cases. Lawyers have been inundated with questions about the effects of force majeure clauses in contracts. In these circumstances, the underlying root cause of the problems is the pandemic. This may leave enough goodwill between disputing parties to encourage them to mediate. Mediation may also be an attractive alternative to court litigation in jurisdictions where the pandemic has caused a backlog of cases. It can enable companies to avoid courts and arbitration and focus their attention and resources on their businesses. The pandemic has also made mediation easier by driving improvements in online mediation. Online platforms have improved security and have integrated tools that are helpful for mediation, like breakout rooms. Experienced mediators that were initially skeptical of mediating online have become vocal advocates. 
Online mediation can bring distant parties in Japan and the Americas together more easily. The online space similarly makes it possible for distant mediators to work together in co-mediation. This can bridge linguistic or cultural divides between parties. It is also easier to integrate remote mediation into other forms of dispute resolution. Because online mediations are easy to convene, claims on their way to arbitration or mediation are easy to intercept, and it is easier to mediate once adversarial proceedings are underway. Online mediation can thus be an effective tool for dispute management between Japanese businesses and their partners in the Americas. With that, I will conclude my comments with thanks to you for your attention. Thank you so much to Shinjin James. And with that, we have reached the end of our presentations and we now have some time to answer some of the questions that have been submitted. And to get us started, I would like to bring up here on screen, one of our students in the International Arbitration Island Program here at Miami Law, Christian Gallerini, who had a question on foreign direct investment. Christian, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you uh, to the panelists for this insightful analysis. So my question was, I was trying to understand if in light of this uh, expansion of Japanese uh, foreign direct inv in investment in the US, we should expect more uh, investment arbitration in the US or, and the Americas or um, like Japanese uh, companies and Japanese affiliate would still not prefer investment arbitration as favorite method of dispute resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Mr. Hayakawa, would you like to take this one first? Thank you very much. And uh, so the thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, the uh, investment uh, treaty arbitration is now uh, becoming a very popular uh, even in the Japanese business corporations. I'm a professor as well, and uh, I uh, have managed for 10 years uh, the kind of the study group, and the study group issued the uh, the case review of the uh, each exit uh, cases in Japanese language uh, in the, uh, the legal, monthly legal journal, which was issued by JCAA. So the uh, Japanese business corporation can easily know about the information or each case details uh, in Japanese language. So the, uh, it is uh, one of the uh, element and uh, additionally, so the uh, Japanese government and uh, of course JDRC uh, is encouraging the Japanese business corporation to use uh, investment treaty arbitration. I'm a, a practicing lawyer as well, and more than ten years ago, uh, the, my client, you know, the asked us uh, to uh, file an investment arbitration against the one uh, the emerging market country and uh, uh, using the, uh, this system. But at that time, the Japanese government, unfortunately, uh, very hesitated to, uh, to make them use uh, the system uh, because of the uh, diplomatic relation concern. However, uh, Japanese government totally changed uh, in their mind. And uh, so that they are now encouraging Japanese business corporation to use it. And additionally, as you know, the, uh, for the uh, investment treaty arbitration, the, the, uh, especially exit cases, the Bennu uh, is uh, always the Washington DC. Sometimes the Japanese business corporation are hesitating to use it because, uh, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the regulation of the uh, host country or because of the, uh, the some kind of the, uh, the bargaining power balance, uh, the, uh, they had to uh, choose the, uh, the a city of the uh, emerging market country or host country uh, in the uh, uh, in their arbitration agreement, but uh, uh, investment treaty agreement they did not have to uh, make a particular additional uh, arbitration agreement. Instead, they can use only just rely on the investment treaty uh, itself. So the, uh, we think you know that we can uh, expect the number of the cases will increase. At the same time, we have to think about you know, the now the kind of the movement, in, especially in Europe, the investment treaty arbitration itself uh, is uh, attacked 
uh, by the uh, such a, uh, European countries and that they try to replace this system by the, uh, the court system, international court system, but it is uh, still premature. So that uh, we have to uh, think about uh, this negative element as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hayakawa. I think some of our other panelists would like to say a word on this question as well. Uh, Professor Claxton. Sure, maybe maybe just a word. That was a very th a thorough explanation. But one, one uh, very small addition is that, of course, the likelihood would depend on whether or not there are actually treaties in place or investment contracts in place that would give rights for the investors to bring claims. And because the TPP in its original form did not actually include the United States, the exposure is quite limited as a result. There still could be exposure on the basis of investment contracts, um, but I'm not familiar with how many investment contracts there are between Japanese, uh, uh, in involving Japanese parties. That's all I had on that one, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other panelists who would like to comment on Christian's question? Uh, here, I can uh, answer a couple of questions, uh, question, a question to uh, Christine's questions. I will practice the Japanese cooperation uh, in, house, in, house, uh, in, in the legal department as a legal advisor. So generally, Japanese company is reluctant to dispute. It's a, I think that it's a culture, uh, so not to dispute, so not, uh, domestically and uh, internationally. So, but uh, I, I've studied the uh, University of Miami in uh, 2016. So be, before 2016, uh, investment arbitration cases, uh, just four cases, but now uh, 2021, so now became uh, 10. So I think that there are, uh, increasing tendency of the investment arbitration cases. I think that because of the Japanese international arbitration practitioners tireless efforts to advocate the investment arbitrations use, usefulness and also the convenience. I think that, so uh, as Professor Clarkson mentioned the investment mediation becomes one of the, uh, one of the tool to, uh, as a legal instrument to uh, solve the uh, investment arbitration could become uh, popular in the future in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other takers or should we move on to the next question? Okay, we have another question here in the Q&A and remember everybody, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we have a question from Naoki Watanabe for Professor Claxton. The question is, it seems to me that the current, oops, it just disappeared as I was reading it. It seems to me that the current reform of Japanese Arbitration Act and the Foreign Lawyers Act will promote ADR, but left civil conciliation procedures unchanged. If you could comment on your thoughts on this leftover that would be much appreciated. Professor Claxton, may we go to you for this one? Great, and I will go, I will go to Yoshi Sensei who wrote out a, a perfect answer to this question. I think it's, it's just a technical point, but the Conciliation Act, the 1951 Act, deals with court annexed uh, mediation. And the, uh, the changes that we talked about with respect to the Japanese Ar Ar Arbitration Act deal with the ability of um, foreign registered lawyers or foreign lawyers to act as counsel in international mediations. So they're really two separate systems. One is a domestic system as one is, and the other is an international system. So I don't, I don't have any insight into whether or not the, the, um, the conciliation law will be revisited at some point, but it's, it was not part of the package of changes to the international arbitration changes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hayakawa, would you like to comment as well? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. And, uh, as uh, uh, the James said, the, you know, this issue the, uh, has not yet been changed uh, by the legislator. And uh, so the, I think you know, the, the traditional uh, Japanese lawyers and uh, uh, governmental officers believed, or court people believed, judges believed, the uh, present procedure is uh, fitting to the traditional way of dispute resolution in Japan. And so the, they uh, do not want to change the uh, system itself. The one of the feature, specific feature of the uh, present conciliation procedure in the Japanese court is uh, uh, that they uh, 
basically use caucus or shuttle mediation. It means that you know, the parties cannot meet each other anytime. And uh, it means that you know, the, uh, the one party can say something, and, but it is secret, and the other party can say something, but uh, it's a secret to others. So and, uh, uh, the, uh, the conciliator uh, knows everything, and the conciliator sometimes could uh, propose uh, uh, the, their own settlement plan different manner. So the, it is uh, uh, not uh, perfectly fitting to the due process, I believe. So the, I think you know, the uh, young generation are uh, changing and the uh, Japanese traditional way of dispute resolution uh, is not uh, the something which cannot be changed. So the, I think you know, the next uh, issue to be changed would be uh, uh, this procedure. So I totally agree on the, uh, the idea from the uh, person who make a question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would anybody else on the panel like to comment on this question? Okay, I think we have time for one more question until uh, unfortunately we have to end the webinar. Um, we have a question here on mediation and arbitration in Japan which legislature and rules will be followed in general, enforceability of the award in a Japanese court and elsewhere? Are there any liberty options to choose the legislator and other arbitration rules? What is the language of the proceedings? Is translation of the proceedings mandatory? And are there any restrictions or preferences as for the nationality and the language spoken by the mediator slash arbitrator? Um, I'm going to open this up for discussion by the panel. Who would like to take this one on? Well, I could start if no one else is, is, is going to start. This, this could be a whole webinar. It's a whole set of really interesting uh, questions. Just really briefly, there's a specific arbitration act in Japan that would apply. I assume the question is about international proceedings and not domestic proceedings. Um, the enforceability would normally be under the New York Convention. Uh, the party, parties to our international arbitration seated in Japan could still choose the rules of an institution outside of Japan, and they can choose the language themselves. And to my, to my knowledge, translation of proceedings um, is not mandatory, uh, and there is no restriction on the nationality and language of the mediator or arbitrator. Thank you so much, Professor Claxton. Um, I believe that our time has now come to an end. So unfortunately, uh, we have to move on to closing remarks. Uh, but I think that was a very good discussion here that we were having in our Q&A session. I would like to thank all of our speakers again for this wonderful discussion today. And with that, I would like to welcome back to the virtual podium, Mr. Yoshihisa Hayakawa for some brief closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah, th th thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you for your management, perfect management of this seminar. And uh, we are approaching the uh, end of the, this seminar. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, one minute. And uh, so the, I'm very happy uh, and to, to experience uh, this, uh, you know, the excellent seminar uh, as a speaker, as a panelist, especially for the last Q&A session is uh, very fruitful. And uh, I think you know that this kind of the joint event uh, should be conducted much more uh, with the JC, uh, JCAA, JDRC, and uh, so the uh, Miami University and uh, uh, the Miami International Arbitration Society and uh, some other people within Florida. So the, uh, this is only just the very beginning. And I think you know, the, uh, we could work together much more uh, for the United States and the Latin America countries and uh, so they try to make a strong relationship uh, between the Japan or East Asia and uh, uh, the UR regions. Thank you very much again. So this is the end of the seminar. Thank you for the audience.